try again here under video 4.3. And this is an evolution of our discussion on ethnicity and nationalism. And we're going to take on now how these concepts can be problematic and ultimately really dangerous. Um, so just to, to address the piece about problematic, we talked about the idea that nations and ethnicities and the idea that a nation can become challenging when a nation is unrecognized. So when we look at the idea, for example, of Spain, Spain has two regions, the Basques in the north and the, uh, and the Catalonia in the southeast, both of which are considered to be nations by the people, yet are unrecognized by the ultimate state. We would call that a stateless nation, no state, yet existence of a nation. And similarly, similarly, just to reiterate, we have the Kurds, the Kurds who are spread across Iraq, uh, Iran, Turkey, Syria, a little bit into Armenia, and that the state of the Kurds is to say the, the existence of the Kurds, but the Kurds do not have a state. They are seeking political independence. They're seeking the creation of Kurdistan. So the Kurds we would consider to be um, a stateless nation as well. So that's just two, two of the initial concepts. So now let's start to see how this evolves into a more problematic idea. First things first is the idea of ethnocentrism. This is just kind of a good general term to know. Ethnocentrism is when you have a tendency to look at the world through your own perspective. So if you look at the behaviors of other groups of people um, and to it to, and decide that that is different, that is lesser than you are. And consider how people often speak of different cultures. Often it comes across in a negative way be, um, be, rather than just simply being expressed as a difference between the two cultures. The, I think this cartoon kind of perfectly uh, expresses that. How do I get to the other side? You are on the other side. So both are assuming their own perspective. This can become problematic because ethnocentrism can ultimately evolve into this feeling of superiority of your own ethnic traditions over that of others. And what we see that ultimately evolve into at times is what we call ethno-nationalism, where ethnic groups see themselves as distinct nations with the right to autonomy or independence in a territory of their own. This is the true idea of ethno-nationalism, um, the idea that these different groups were seeking that, that autonomy and that legal organization. Just as I mentioned, the Basques in Catalonia, the Basques and the, and the region of Catalonia would, uh, are seeking for that ethno-nationalism, seeking their own right to rule themselves. We refer to that right to rule yourself, yourself as self-determination. The ability, the, I'm sorry, this shouldn't be the word govern there. The ability of a government to determine their own course or free will. The ability of a people to rule themselves. Similarly, just a, a reiteration of what we studied with Belgium, we see this with the Flemish and the Walloons, you know, that peaceful coexistence, but both still have a strong sense of ethno-nationalism. Where these things, when these concepts of ethnicity and nationalism start to turn dangerous and, and wrong um, is when those feelings of ethno-nationalism start to turn into this feeling of um, that, that others must leave if they are not part of this ethnic group. And we start to see some pretty horrific things which we would call ethnic cleansing, which has sadly happened many times in the course of human history. Ethnic cleansing is the process by which a more powerful ethnic group forcibly removes a less powerful one in order to create an ethnically homogeneous region. Um, we will not be using this on the AP exam, but just as an example to, uh, to connect this to something you likely have already studied, historically, Nazi, Nazi Germany's final solution would be an example of ethnic cleansing, when the government is specifically taking actions to eradicate and to get rid of an ethnic group of people, one ethnicity, so as to make the entire state more ethnically homogeneous. And that's exactly what Adolf Hitler sought to do. So we're going to take a look at a couple examples of this. Um, the first one is, is related to Sudan um, in the Darfur crisis. So the background here is that Sudan um, has, a, is a, a, um, has a lot of religious diversity. Specifically, it, the Muslim concentration was largely found in the north. Well, the, the, primary, the, the southern region of Sudan is primarily Christian. And long-standing tensions between the two groups ultimately led to the creation of the country of uh, South Sudan. So there's a Muslim north with the Sud country of Sudan and a non-Muslim south. So largely Christian, but there's other denominations of, and other religions found in South Sudan as well. Sadly, that was not necessarily the solution, right? Because in the western region of Sudan, this region known as Darfur, right here, the, there was an uprising of black farmers um, who were uh, protesting discrimination and protesting, well, seeking more rights um, from the government of Sudan. Yet the Sudanese government responded with unbelievable force. It crushed the rebellion of the black farmers. Um, they, they actually aligned themselves with the herders, the Janjaweed, 
and the, those two groups of people committed pretty horrific crimes against the, the farmers of this region. Herders and farmers often come into conflict just because they're uh, two different lifestyles around the same general trade and in their, their competing resources in some senses. So the Darfur crisis sadly has continued. The many, uh, tremendous amount of death, tremendous amount of violence, tremendous amount of starvation due to the lack of resources that are available there. Um, so yet another example of the ethnic cleansing. One that you may be more familiar with happened in Rwanda in the 1990s. The, in the Rwanda genocide, the Hutu majority, so the Hutu ethnicity, murdered around 800,000 Tutsi minority. So similar um, background to the story, there have been long-standing tensions between the, Tuts the Tutsis and the Hutus. Tutsis were originally cattle herders. Hutus were originally settled farmers. So again, the idea of someone moving around and um, using a large amount of land comes into conflict with, the, with people who have whose trade has them settled in one particular area. And the conflict really originated because the Tutsis were only, the only the Tutsis, were put in power, positions of power by the colonizing Germans. So as a result of that, we have um, a tremendous, tremendous conflict between, uh, well, significant conflict. And as soon as Rwanda gained its independence, the Hutu majority organized themselves to ethnically cleanse the Tutsi minority who had been specifically in power in, in pretty horrific ways. Um, that bottom right-hand picture is an example of a, a church that was burned when it was full of, of Tutsi. So again, this is a, a, a truly horrific uh, example, a particularly a horrific example that can happen with these concepts of ethnicity and nationalism. The one we're going to talk about at greater length here is what happened in the former country known as Yugoslavia. I'm going to have you copy this down, and this is the last slide we're going to return to at the end. Yugoslavia is such an interesting and, and terrible, in some way, example of this process known as balkanization. This is for which the term is named. Uh, the balkanization is the process by which a state breaks down along ethnic lines. Um, this is named for the complete devolution of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia is a process by which regions are given more autonomy, so Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, all of these different regions within this country of Yugoslavia had a fair amount of autonomy. They had been devolved. They said they were, the central authority had been given to different, had devolved some of its power to the regions. But ultimately, the country of Yugoslavia completely broke apart along the ethnic lines, and that's called balkanization. So here's how it happened. There's a little bit of confusion. So this, is, this can be confusing, so bear with me here. The, former, the background here is that the former country of Yugoslavia existed in an area that's known as a shadow belt, shatter belt. Just think of a, a window and a shatter. The, um, if you break a window, the, you see the point of contact where it breaks, and there's all those lines that, that, emit, that are emitted from the, the initial point of contact. And I want you to think about the country of Yugoslavia and the concept of a shatter belt as those other lines. Just because they are not necessarily involved in the, the direct conflict, they themselves are often trapped in between more powerful areas. So they themselves are often, um, their borders are constantly redrawn. They're constantly uh, going back and forth between the rule of different people. And that's exactly what the, uh, the, the case with Yugoslavia. Its borders were consistently being redrawn. It was a shatter belt region. Two different examples of shatter belts. Malaysia is another example of a shatter belt. It's, tra it's got a tremendous influence between Indonesia and Chinese, uh, the China population that's emigrated there. Malaysia is a good example. Um, another example there is Indonesia, the shadow belt. Lots of different, um, the territory has consistently been redrawn. Lots of different ethnic groups that comprise those regions. Um, Israel and Palestine, those are both, that, that's a, obviously a shadow belt region, continuing to have its borders redrawn along, along or not along ethnic lines. So that gives you the background there. So let's start with where Yugoslavia is. So you, here we are in Europe. Yugoslavia is an area known as the Balkans. The Balkans, as shown here in green, are named after the Balkan mountain range that really separates out this sort of sub, sub well, peninsula uh, area here. So we've got the Balkans, uh, the Balkan mountains, and here are the Balkans. This is a, you don't need to copy this down. This is just um, to give you the, the setting here. There's a long-standing Ukraine, a long-standing um, phrase that was, was said in Yugoslavia, which is to say, Yugoslavia has seven neighbors, six republics, five nationalities, four languages, three religions, two alphabets, and one dinar, which is the currency. In other words, Yugoslavia was an incredibly diverse place. So let's establish what that means. Yugoslavia had all these different ethnic groups with a strong sense of self-determination. There were six separate republics. I want you to think of republics as regions. But as I mentioned before, each one of these regions had a fair amount of authority over itself in a way that was somewhat unusual um, for both the time period 
and for just a general, generally speaking of countries. There's Slovenia, Bosnia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Serbia, Macedonia, excuse me, Montenegro, and Macedonia. These two regions here, they're going to be important later. Kosovo and Vojvodina. Sorry, I mispronounced that one a lot. Um, so these are these are called autonomous regions. They are part of they originally were part of Serbia, but they too had even more independence than within that of, of Serbia. So we're going to come back to that concept because it's going to influence us in a second. Um, so this is the background setting. We do not need to copy this down. I just want to establish what you what, what some of the diversity is here. The Serbs here were mostly Orthodox Christians. The Croats were mostly Roman Catholics. The Slovenians also mostly Roman Catholic. Macedonians. Uh, we're 25% Muslim, 75% Orthodox. And what we have here is in Bosnia. Bosnia and Herzegovina were mostly Muslim, but also had some Croats and some Serbs. So we have a, a, quite a, a mosaic of people. And this, this map better kind of shows you the distribution of the ethnicities. You can see really a lot of um, a true multi, multinational and multi-ethnic state. Here's a distribution of the religions. You can see it doesn't necessarily fall along the neat lines here. So really, truly a diverse place here in Yugoslavia. Um, and this, in case you are interested in breaking that down, you can see here again. Uh, I want to point out here that the Serbs are e primarily Eastern Orthodox. And you can, that's important because that's going to come back in a minute. And this, the uh, the Croats are largely Catholic, right, with a Serb minority. And here again, we have Bosnia and Herzegovina with um, a plurality of Muslims. And then here's the minority of the Croats and the Serbs. So we're going to start here in the, in the interactions with these three regions. After World War II, when these, um, when the entire uh, country here was unified, there was a leader named Joseph Tito. And Joseph Tito was an incredibly strict ruler, but what he did is he was able to generally unify Yugoslavia by giving the regions authority and by using communism this, um, to unite these regions. But by the death of Tito um, in the 19, late 1980s and then by 1992, we have a strong sense of nationalism from independent minorities reviving. Specifically, in this area of Serbia, we have the rise of this man named Slobodan Milosevic, who came to, uh, as he came to power, proclaiming that they need to make a, quote, greater Serbia. And what he means by that is he means that all of the Serbs that live in these regions need to be united under this greater Serbia. This, of course, is going to be pretty dangerous because this is already going to start to break down the integrity of the state. So Slobodan Milosevic becomes very powerful because he has a tremendous following. And we start, I'm sorry, we'll come back to this slide. We start to see under those nationalism that people start to break away from Yugoslavia. First, Slovenia declared their independence away from the rest of Yugoslavia, then Bosnia and Herzegovina, or excuse me, then Croatia, then Bosnia and Herzegovina. So as we see people starting to break apart, we start to see that this rise of Serbia and this idea of taking over other territory is too gaining ground. What, what sadly starts to take place is that Slobodan Milosevic starts to launch a, a straight-up ethnic war, again, specifically in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So just to frame ourselves again, I'm sorry I'm flipping back so much. Here's Bosnia and Herzegovina. Serbia sees um, itself as needing to unite all of the Serbs who live within this region. So the, the, the real source of conflict then comes in here with Bosnia and Herzegovina. Bosnia has a 48% Bosnian Muslim population, 30%, 37% Kurds and Croats. Initially, the, Bosnia, the Muslims and the Croats in Bosnia, so the Croats here in the pink and the, the Bosnian Muslims in the green, initially, they start to unite themselves against the, real, the threat of the, the yellow shown here, the Serbs. But then it gets even more complicated because then the Bosnian Muslims and Croats turn on each other and they start to fight one another too. But ultimately what we see is that, oh, I'm sorry, this is a slide I should have shown you. The, uh, the objective here was that or if they eradicate these Bosnian Muslims, then the Serbs who live here in, Serb in Bosnia can then more easily unite with greater Serbia. So as I just mentioned, the Croats were initially aligned with the Bosnian Muslims, but then they too begin to fight one another. So there's just absolute unbelievable ethnic conflict here. The true tragedy and the true force here, though, was the, the efforts of this man, Slobodan Milosevic, who was eventually um, committed, who actually was, um, he was uh, deemed a criminal for war crimes. Some of the horrific things that happened to the Bosnian Muslims who lived here in the, Serbia's effort to ethnically cleanse this area. Um, you can see some of the mass graves, unbelievable amount of people who were forced out of their homes, 
the true genocide that's said to have occurred is the, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, but I think it's the Spring, uh, Springjeka massacre, and I apologize if that was terrible mispronunciation. Um, but the, in this instance, over 8,000 Muslim men um, and over Muslim men and boys were killed, and this is the, um, the graveyard here, and over 30,000 citizens were displaced, which is to say they were kicked out of their homes. Um, so truly a, just a horrific, horrific example of this ethno-nationalism that the Serbians had, had taken on. Uh, in this instance, and as a result of that, thousands of Bosnian Muslims, as I just said, were killed. There were a lot of Bosnian Croats who were also killed as well. So the Croats who lived here, um, you can see initially, again, the pink was allied. The, the Croats were originally allied with Serbia, but then they too, in that instance, were killed by Serbians. But they also were, um, they also engaged in some of the warfare as well. So really just an all-around, um, just terrible instance of, of the troubles of this of nationalism. So even after um, this ethnic cleansing, Serbia itself was still a multi-ethnic state. Remember I mentioned at the beginning that area of Kosovo right here, that, that area that had some autonomy? Actually, the map I showed you originally was here, right? Here, uh, Kosovo here. So after Serbia has engaged, during this engagement with, with um, ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, we also see so much conflict here in Kosovo, and here's why. In Kosovo, which is part of Serbia originally, where's my map? There we go. Here's Kosovo, part of Serbia. Even even while they're engaging in this this ethnic cleansing in Bosnia, so I guess I had to delete some space. Okay, even after, okay, sorry guys. Um, even after ethnic cleansing, Serbia is still multi-ethnic because there's all of these Albanians, a different country, there are all of these ethnic Albanians living in this region of Kosovo. So, sim so just as they did in Bosnia, the Serbians begin to engage in a massive ethnic cleansing against the Albanians who live in this region of Kosovo. So yet another tragedy here. The Serbians showed up, they rolled up with military force and tanks in the Albanian regions. They started kidnapping men. Uh, maybe they forced them and conscript them, or they would just, quote-unquote, disappear. Um, and if their families had no idea what happened to them, they would set cities completely on fire so people would have no choice but to emigrate, and they would just quite simply force the people out. So we have yet another example of this ethnic cleansing here in this, autonom this relatively autonomous region of Kosovo. You can see that people, some people fled to Bosnia, some most fled uh, to Albania, some went down here into Macedonia and Montenegro. But yet another just terrible, horrific tragedy. Um, that you can see here. Um, I'm going to have you watch this short video uh, as part of the uh, analysis questions. Just here, just some of the really truly horrific um, things that happened as a result of this ethnic cleansing. Peace. Peace came um, within Dayton. The United States helped negotiate this in Dayton, Ohio, um, in 1996. Um, the, ultimately, the countries effectively remained the same borders um, as they were under Yugoslavia, but as independent countries. Um, the area of Kosovo was actually, began, I'm going to skip ahead for a second, the area of Kosovo was what became administered by the UN, which is to say the UN has a permanent international presence there to, make, to maintain peacekeeping. Um, but there, there's this kind of sad reality, which is the idea that peace perpetuated the idea that the ethnic cleansing, quote unquote, worked. That Serbia remained Serbia and that they had significant more ethnic homogeneity that there's um, the Bosnians, the Herzegovinians, the Croatia, all, everybody is now sort of separated out into different ethnicities. So it sort of brings up this question, is ethnic homogeneity the price of peace? Do we need to be ethnically homogeneous to ha have peace in this region? Um, so there's, there's peace that has existed, but yet kind of a sad reality that, that there was not a multi-ethnic solution um, and coexistence in that sense. So that brings us back to the term. Balkan to say that an area is balkanized is to say it's a small area that cannot be organized into more, one or more stable states because it's inhabited with ethnicities that have long-standing problems and antagonisms with one another, which is exactly what we have here in the Balkans. Um, so that term balkanization is named after the, where exactly what happened to Yugoslavia, where the, the country itself fell apart along these ethnic lines. All right, guys, thanks for sticking with me. Um, and go ahead and knock out those analysis questions.